is what we call the floor of our MRF, a material recovery facility. And this is where our trucks will dump recycling loads. And as you can see, it's a pretty giant pile right now. One of the things we have to do is remove all the contamination. So about 10% of what's in here is not recyclable, that soft plastic, styrofoam. And then the other thing we need to do is separate out all the recyclables into the different materials, the cardboard from the paper and the different types of plastic and metal and glass. I don't use the word garbage because it just is meaningless. We throw out materials every day. Now some we can recover, some we can't. But I think if you just think of waste as a verb and not just a noun, you start to get closer to the solution. Our technical term is landfill diversion. So how much do you keep away from landfill disposal? And currently we're at 68% as a city. That triangle, or what we call our chasing arrows, um, you'll find on all types of plastic, soft and hard. And that's just telling you what type of plastic resin it's made out of. It does not mean it's recyclable. This is what we call soft plastic. It's squishy and we never want it in your recyclables or your recycling, including not even bagging your material. So this is one of our first steps in sorting out contamination. And on this line, we typically have four people who are hand sorting this material, pulling off items that don't belong. So we'll be able to see the actual recyclable material down the line. even bagged recyclables, your bag of recyclables will not make it to recycling because it's a safety hazard to our employees. The next on the line is our cardboard screen. We actually added this in a few years ago because of the proliferation of cardboard boxes from online shipping. We call it the Amazon effect. Uh, these, these large rollers and cardboard rolls along the top. Everything else that's smaller, bottles, cans, and paper falls down onto the other conveyor belt. Now the cardboard comes out this line with a few people to pull out stuff that doesn't belong. Then the cardboard separated can go off to be bailed. The rest of the recyclables continue on their journey. The city has had curbside programs since 1991, but it was pretty limited on the range of recyclables that we could get, and it was very manual. So you would have bins, and you put your newspaper in one bin, and you put your glass in another, and you put your bottles and cans in a third, and that was asking a lot of our citizens. Since 2005, we've had what's called single stream recycling. So that's where you can mix bottles and cans and paper into one stream, then we sort it out for you. After the cardboard sorter, this is our next sorting station, where we have, again, people hand sorting materials that either don't belong or that we're trying to capture for recycling. So some people are sorting off those pesky soft plastics that we talked about, like your plastic bags or your film plastic, but they're also pulling off recyclable material that we do want. So here we're gonna finally start to separate the bottles and cans from the paper. Now these screens are set up so that the glass will break and fall through onto a conveyor belt below. The paper is two dimensional and lighter, and so what happens is it continues up, it climbs up to the top, and it goes off the end and it goes onto our paper line and the bottles and cans, the three-dimensional heavier things, actually fall down to the bottom and go onto another conveyor belt. And this is really how we separate the bottles and cans to go over to their area and the paper to go here to get cleaned up and recycled. This is our new machine called an optical sorter. It uses light to separate plastic, the soft plastic we've been talking about, and paper from each other. So as the paper comes along, it identifies whether it's cardboard paper or film plastic, and it actually shoots air to blow the paper one way, it'll shoot air to blow the cardboard the other way. And after the optical sorter cleans the paper, the paper comes down the conveyor belt to the baler. And the baler smashes the paper up into a cube, just like a hay bale on a farm, wraps it in wire, and that 12 to 1500 pound bale of paper comes out the end and then is stacked out and ready to ship to make something new out of it. So the city of Napa owns the recycling and composting facility and a private contractor operating it. And that contractor is Napa Recycling and Waste Services. They are a local company. They really do care. They live here. There is a vested interest in the local community and the success of our local programs. So on these screens where the paper, the two-dimensional paper goes up and the bottles and cans roll down, it's also shaking it and so glass breaks 
right? And the glass breaks and falls through these screens onto these other conveyor belts. And then it goes into our glass cleaner, which is a machine that basically is blowing the paper away from it or any other things that are not glass so that the glass is cleaner and can go to recycle. This is called the container line. And we have sorters here that are pulling out the different types of bottles, boxes, of cartons, um, different recyclable items and dropping them into those chutes. And then it'll come right down into this container. So they're separating them by types of material and they're designated on what type of material they're separating. The next stop is our magnet. This magnetic sorter is extra strength and it'll literally suck up any sort of tin and scrap metal. So after the magnet comes an eddy current, which is a reverse magnet. So this is a magnet that actually pushes away aluminum because aluminum is not magnetic. And then the aluminum is sorted a little bit more so we can sort the cans from the foil and from other little metal items. Here at the end of our sorting line, we've added robots. They use artificial intelligence to capture things that haven't been caught yet. And so it comes in on the conveyor belt and there's a computer. And the computer actually takes a picture of everything it sees. It then uses this little suction cup to pick it really quickly and drop it into a chute. So you can see the robot like taking pictures and then it's psh, 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 and dropping it down the chute. And after that, there's one more person who can really catch anything that really fell through the cracks and wasn't sorted yet, different cans, and then it goes off the end of the line. This is really a public-private partnership, um, and you kind of get the best of both worlds. On the public side, we're not about efficiency, we're about accountability to our ratepayers and to our citizens. The private sector, they're very nimble and efficient in what and how they do business, and they know what they're doing. And we get the benefit, we being the city of Napa and our ratepayers get the benefit of that. You know, having a four-year-old, almost five, who is constantly asking for one thing and then changing their mind, and then you have this bowl of food, and I don't always want to eat what's in that bowl. So I will either give it to the chickens or I'll put in compost, knowing that it's not really going to waste. It, it works. It makes me feel better about food waste, that it's not just going into the landfill. Our garden and the city really have a partnership. So we're really closing the loop because we, we have a relationship that we give to them what we can't use and then we get back from them to help supplement our soil, to help our garden and plants grow and give back to the community by participating in the composting program. I like to call compost anything that was ever alive, plant or animal. So you can really think about your coffee filters that were you know, once a tree, so that those coffee beans and that filter can all go into your compost cart outside. This is the beginning of the composting operation. So this is one of our residential trucks dumping a load of yard trimmings and food scraps. And from here, it'll go into our process. Um, they'll grind it, remove materials that can't be composted, and then it'll go into the composting operation. The loader dumps it into the um, hopper and it goes up this conveyor belt. And then um, there's screens, you know, similar to what are in our recycling facility. Um, and what they're doing is they're just kind of moving the material over and the small stuff falls through. And the small stuff is really just like leaves and fruit and little pieces of yard trimmings. And that goes outside the building and that's good to go to composting. It doesn't need to be ground through our other machines. So after that, the bigger stuff goes on to the conveyor belt where we have our sorter. So the big items will come through here and they fall off actually. So you get a lot of like large, dense pieces of wood. There's a two people, one on each side, typically with a tool. And if they find something that's not compostable, they can use a tool and grab it off and it'll actually be put into the giant dumpster below. This is another safeguard we have in place for the composting process to ensure non-organic material does not end up in our composting in the final product. Um, and then it'll go on. It'll go on to the next part, which is a grinder. 
um, making all the pieces small, and then through our trommel. If you think about what's going through this system, you have a lot of wood, and you have also yard trimmings, leaves, food scraps. Um, the wood really doesn't break down very well in the composting process. It just takes forever to decompose. So we have other uses for wood. So we'll remove the wood, and what we do is once it's ground, and it goes through that trommel screen, there's all the small stuff, the fines, which are really the organics that we want to compost, will fall out. It also gives us a way that we can separate the plastics that are in there. So we're kind of removing the big stuff from the little stuff. And then there's another machine, which acts like a vacuum to suck off plastic bags, kind of made it through for whatever reason. And then finally, you can go off the end of the line. Over there, you see wood. Um, that will go for biomass electricity for energy production. So we can generate all the electricity to run all this equipment and really be you know, a closed loop system. Composting. What we do is really basic on one level. Are there little garbage men running around the forest floor and collecting the organic material to compost? No, Mother Nature has figured it out. So a lot of what we're doing is getting back to the basics and just trying to understand the natural systems and then putting it on an industrial scale. And that's what our composting system really is. And I think the public-private partnership has allowed for that. We're pulling on the same end of the rope, trying to get to that higher diversion rate, but also the capture of materials and the preventing of waste in the first place. It's the key to multiple environmental savings, not just keeping a few, some tons out of landfill. This is our covered aerated static pile composting system. So we used to just have open windrows, which is just piles that we would turn with our tractors, with our loaders. And this new system actually has pipes underneath the concrete. So this is our blowers, right? So underneath that concrete pad are all the pipes. So over there you have a big blower and it's actually just blowing air into the different pipes and then down underneath the concrete pad and then back up into the different areas of the composting operation. So you can hear the air blowing and there's these holes and the air blows up into the piles. And those pipes are blowing air through the piles uh, mechanically. And so there's these holes, there's 3,300 of them throughout this whole two acre pad. And what it does is we'll load the material in that we process, that organic waste, into these bays. And then the air will start to aerate them. And composting, those microbes really need oxygen and they need water. And this is actually giving them oxygen very quickly and in a very uniform manner so that the decomposition process can happen very quickly. And so we don't have to turn them. That's why it's called static pile. And then the cover is actually just a finished layer of compost or compost overs. And that acts as a biofilter. So any emissions that are coming off the piles and odors are actually being stopped by that filter. And then we'll just put our um, sprinklers on top to water the piles. And then right up there, you see some wires with probes, and those are our temperature and aeration probes. So we'll actually put those in to the piles, and um, they keep temperature so that we know which areas of the pile need more air or less air, because we want the piles to be between 131 degrees and 170 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the magic temperature range for a compost. And then after 23 days, it's taken out. It goes across the street to be um, cured for 40 more days. And in those piles, um, there's no active aeration, but they are continuing to compost and finish so that the product then can be screened and go to market. So the whole process is just a little over 60 days to go from material that you saw being dumped to being finished compost. So this is where we're going to screen our finished compost. Um, this is a trommel screen, and they dump in the material and it rotates and there's three eighths inch holes. And so the compost, the fine material, goes outside and that's our finished product that can go be sold. So you can see how rich and earthy it looks. Usually there's steam coming off as well because it's so hot. Um, a bigger pile of our finished product would definitely have steam, um, but absolutely gorgeous. What we throw out what we throw away, everybody has to realize there's no true away. Where does it really go? Uh, and is it a good idea to make mountains out of waste? 
or is it a better idea to recapture it and make it something beneficial? The idea of recycling, it's not just about the landfill space you save, but all the virgin materials that you didn't have to extract from the environment and all those impacts, the pollution that goes down, um, the water savings, it just unlocks so many things and it's a real practical thing that can and should be done. You're doing something active and important for our world.